Good morning. Week two, and you made it back. Awesome. We are so glad to have you. And I love that song because I don't know about you, but I know for me, in light of this week's lesson, I have been so much more aware of the Lord's presence, the Holy Spirit, just just so sweet, such a gift to us. I am so excited to be back with you all, and I am so excited to be digging into the book of Acts alongside of you. As I've been studying this first chapter of Acts and finishing up lesson one, and really just praying and planning for this year, it's really been impressed upon my heart that what we, were, what we are studying, the book of Acts, is just so appropriate for where we are right now as a church, as a women's ministry, as individuals, and I am just so excited to be able to walk through this new work that the Lord is going to be doing in each one of us individually and together in our groups and really just as a body of Christ here, uh, just being in the word together and fellowshipping over that. It's, I'm so excited. You know, the Lord has been really impressing upon my heart specifically uh, some words and scripture for this year of Bible study for us as a whole. And it's really just been reinforced to me over and over in various ways. I love how the Lord does that. And the words for me are grace and truth, reminding me that he gives more grace, right? We're all recipients of his grace. He gives more grace and so should we. And truth because, as we'll talk about today, his Holy Spirit has come. And John 16, 13 says, he will take us by the hand and guide us into all the truth that there is. I love that. All the truth that there is. What a gift the Holy Spirit is to us as believers. And there have been several scriptures I feel like the Lord has been impressing on my heart as well. But one of them that has been the heaviest, and I believe it's for... Uh, this, this season of Bible study is Ephesians 4, 15, and 16. If you just want to jot it down, you can look at it later. But it says, But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. Verse 16, From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. And I love that because we each have a part to play here. We are the body of Christ. And our prayer and our heart this year is that we will see just that more than ever. That we will see the whole body, the whole body of women that fill the seats of this campus, the women that are watching online, those that fill the seats of our satellite campuses each week, that we will see them healthy and growing and full of love. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just come before you now, and we are so thankful for the privilege it is to gather here together as a body of believers and study your word. We do not take that for granted. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you here to teach us and to bring to remembrance the things that we've learned. We invite you here. Fall afresh on this place. Teach us all that you would have us to learn today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you haven't already opened your Bibles, would you open them to Acts chapter 1? So Kathy gave us just a great introduction last week on the, what the book of Acts is really all about. And I love what she said. It kind of sets the tone so we understand kind of what the culture was like during the day of the early church. She said, it was a culture of slaves and peasants who were nobodies that became somebodies in a time when the Roman Empire was ruling and reigning the world with an iron fist. That kind of sets the tone for us. And they did that through the power of the Holy Spirit that Christ made available to us. It's been said that the book of Acts is not necessarily the acts of all the apostles, but it might as well be called the acts of the risen Christ through the Holy Spirit. Would you look at verse 1 with me? It says, The former account I made, O Theophilus, of, that, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach, highlight to do and to teach, until the day he was taken up, after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. 
As we learned in our lesson this week, the book of Acts is the second book that Luke had written to Theophilus, the first being the Gospel of Luke. And as Luke was introducing this book of Acts, he tells us that his first book, the book of Luke, was written to tell us all about what Christ did and taught. And I love how, Christ, how Luke says that, all that Christ did and all that he taught. Because the important thing is, is that Christ did just that. He did what he taught. He led by example. He was full of love, he was full of humility, he was full of grace, he was full of boldness, and he was full of mercy. And he taught us to live that way. He taught us to live that way when he gave us the Sermon on the Mount or the Beatitudes. He taught that through the parables that he shared. He, sh he really taught us that all throughout his public ministry. But first, he showed us by doing. I don't know, you may be like me where you learn best by watching people do the right thing. For example, now that I'm a parent, I pray daily that my daughter Paisley will fall in love with the Word of God. But I can't just tell her to fall in love with the Word of God, and I too must love it and live it. Growing up with my, in my parents' home, I often went to my dad and sought counsel and advice from him on various situations, and he would always point me to the Word of God. And I love that. He still does that. But the important thing that I remember about growing up there, even more than those specific conversations, is the consistency of waking up every morning and seeing my dad in his chair or on the couch with a stack of books and his Bible just spending time in the Word. It's the consistency of doing. It's the way we learn. And I pray that my daughter Paisley and your children will see that consistency in our lives as well. I'm so thankful for Christ's example throughout the scripture. And we see that Luke found it important too, so important that he mentioned it in that first, uh, first verse in chapter one. Let's move on to verse three. It says, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during the 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. You see, from the time of the resurrection to the time that Jesus ascended to heaven, there was a 40 day period. And in those 40 days, Christ appeared to his disciples several times. We also read in the gospels that he appeared to Mary Magdalene, he appeared to the women at the tomb. He appeared to Peter. He appeared as we're going to talk about and as we probably read in Luke 24 that he appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. He appeared to the disciples in the upper room. Jesus showed himself to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Thomas put his hand inside of Jesus' side. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, after that he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that he was seen by James, then by all of the apostles, then last of all he was seen by me, by one who was born out of due time. And again, that was Paul speaking. I'm not sure how many of you actually went back to Luke chapter 24 and uh, read that, but I'm sure either way you all remember when Jesus appeared to the apostles at the road to Emmaus. And as they were walking, these men, they were t walking and talking of all that they had seen Christ do and all that they had heard him preach. They were talking about how he had been crucified and now the tomb that he had been buried in was empty. Can you imagine that? You were an apostle. You had walked with Christ. You really, really knew him. You experienced that horrific crucifixion that he had to endure. And then three days later, his tomb was empty. The tomb that you knew that he had been buried in, firsthand. It says that as they walked, that they conversed and they reasoned. And it says that they were sad because they were really just trying to figure out what that logical answer was for all that had happened. And I think about that, and I think we would probably be doing the same thing, right? We'd be walking with our family or walking with our friends, and we'd be like, okay, we saw this, we saw this, but what happened? And as they were walking on that road to Emmaus, it says that Christ appeared to them, but we know that Luke 24, 16 says that their eyes were restrained, so they did not know it was him. So Jesus is walking with him, and these apostles didn't know that this man next to them was Jesus, and they began telling him how they had hoped that that man that was crucified, that man that they walked with, they had hoped that he would be the one to come and restore their kingdom to them. 
that he would be the one to restore Israel in a physical sense, to rebuild their territory or their empire. And after Jesus had been walking with them to some, for some time, he turned to them on that road and he said, you guys, are you so slow at heart? Remember all that Moses and the prophets have said? Essentially, he was giving them a Bible study on the Old Testament and everything in it that had testified of him. All of these things had to happen so that Christ could enter into his glory. And then it goes on a little later to say that he expounded to them all the things concerning him. I mean, here's Christ walking with these apostles and he's explaining to him again his purpose of why, he's, why he came and why he must ascend. So then after their conversation on the road to Emmaus, we know that Jesus then went, went and broke bread with them. And it says that then, that is when he opened up their eyes and they knew it was him. What a moment. Can you imagine you'd been walking with this man and you didn't know it was Christ and then you were sitting here and all of a sudden your eyes were opened and you knew that it was Christ. Their eyes were restrained and now at that moment they recognized who it was that they were sitting with. It was the one that they had been mourning over, the one that they were hoping and praying would come, had come to restore their kingdom. And they said to each other, and I can just picture it, you know, looking at each other like, did not our hearts burn within us? I told you, did not our hearts burn within us when he opened the scriptures to us? And then in Luke 24, 45, when he had appeared to them again and they were still skeptical, it says that he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And after he had revealed to them, accomplishing, as Luke had mentioned, those many infallible proofs, he told them in the last few verses of Luke 24 that they were the witnesses, that they were the ones that had seen the things that people would talk about for centuries to come. They were the ones that had seen the risen Lord that we're talking about and studying even today, centuries later. They had seen the risen Lord. And I just can't help but love the grace and the patience that Jesus had for his apostles. I mean, if you think about it, how many times did he have to come and reinforce his purpose and explain himself to them again? Over and over. The Lord knows us. He knows that we're skeptical. He knows that we can be stubborn. He knows that at times we lack faith. And he knew that of the apostles too. He knows that each of us are like sheep who are prone to wonder and prone to wander. And Luke emphasized in verse 3 that there were many infallible proofs. And I know that was for a reason because Jesus was intentional about making his appearances in a way that they could not be discredited. Because we all know that it was only hours after the resurrection that they had already began to attempt to discredit the resurrection of Christ. And isn't it the same way today? When the Lord reveals himself to us, he does it in a way that we just can't deny it was him, right? We're reading the scripture and this, the words, the scriptures just illuminate off the pages to us. And maybe it's a scripture that we've read a dozen times or so. Or maybe it's when you're sharing Christ with someone and you feel that power come up from within you and those words that are not of you. Or maybe it's that conviction of the Holy Spirit of sin in your life and you know that the Holy Spirit brought that about or maybe it's during a dark trial or tragedy that you're experiencing in your life and you're experiencing that peace that you just can't explain that surpeace that, that surpasses all understanding those are interactions with the Lord that we can't deny or of him they're unfailing and they're powerful and we all know that they're clearly not of ourselves if you look at verse 4 with me, it says, And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. Some versions and the other Gospels shed a little bit more light. They tell us that when Jesus told them these things, that they were eating together. And I love that some of the sweetest moments, some of the most intimate, intimate moments that Christ had with his, with his disciples was while they ate together. I don't know about you, but when I'm sitting down at a meal with my family or my friends or my mom, I just, I so treasure those moments. You know, it's a time where we can just sit and we can share our hearts together. We can talk about what's been going on in our lives. It's so much more intimate than a text message or an email. It's personal. 
And Jesus was personal, and Jesus was intimate, and he still is personal and intimate. I remember when my not yet husband and I had really been praying and fasting as to where the Lord would really lead us in our relationship and we had fasted from each other and we had just been praying as to whether we should move forward or whether we should move back or what it was and it was during that time of fasting that we both felt that God had confirmed to each of us in different ways that we were to be married. And it was over a dinner together, over a meal together, that we sat and we talked about all that the Lord had shown us, all that the Lord had confirmed to us. We talked and we prayed and we cried and we ate. We fellowship and we broke bread together. So as they were eating, Jesus tells them essentially, okay, stay here, stay in the city of Jerusalem until you've been clothed with the power on high. And he reminds them that this gift of the Holy Spirit that he's talking about is something that he had been promising them. And I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about how we read so many times in the Gospels that Jesus referenced the Holy Spirit. But I'd not always really thought this through or considered the fact that they really hadn't yet received that Holy, Sp that Holy Spirit power that would enable them to turn their world upside down, that power that would be available to all who believed. And Jesus had promised the Holy Spirit. He promised the Holy Spirit in Luke 11:13 when he said, if you then being evil know how to give, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who, who ask him? It was a promise. And then in John 7, 39, he explained, the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Christ was not yet glorified. John 14, 16 says, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. That too was a promise. John 15, 26, but when the helper comes, whom, shall I, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. It was a promise. John 16, 7 says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. It was a promise. It's like you can just sense it. Jesus was excited to give this gift of the Holy Spirit to his children. And he's excited for us as his children to receive that gift. Jesus said it was to their advantage that he left because he was going to send the helper. And to me, that means that this gift of the Holy Spirit is huge. It's substantial because if it was going to be better for them that he in his body was there, that they could see him, they could touch him, they could hear him just audibly, if it was better that he ascended so that he could send the Holy Spirit, that's saying a lot. And I remember something that Kathy said last week. She said that when Mary was clinging to Jesus, he told her this because he knew that she would have to sleep. He knew that she would have to be parted from him at some point. She couldn't always physically cling to him. But the Holy Spirit was a gift that would abide with her forever. And the Holy Spirit is a gift that would, will abide with us forever and always. Verse 5 says, For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. I remember when I was uh, beginning to really study the Word and I began to attend prayer meetings and home Bible studies, and the topic would often come up about the difference between the filling of the Spirit, the baptism of the Spirit, the indwelling of the Spirit, and so on. And and really, there are only three relationships that Jesus talks about that a person can have with the Holy Spirit. So if you're taking notes, number one, prior to your conversion, it was the Holy Spirit who convicted you of your sin. It was the Holy Spirit who revealed Jesus Christ to you as the one who would cleanse you from your sin. It was the Holy Spirit that convinced you and convicted you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord. We know in John 16, 8, it says, And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Do you remember when the Holy Spirit first convicted you of your sin? When he put that realization that you needed Christ, that you needed a Savior? I remember that in my life. 
But notice how John here in John 16, 8 uses the word he. He talks about the Holy Spirit. He says he will convict. And this is important because it's important to know that the Holy Spirit is not an it. It's not some sort of lifeless force. Even though that we read throughout scripture that there are some word pictures of things that are used such as rushing winds or divided flames or even a dove. These are just words that are given to help us better understand the attributes of the Holy Spirit, to help us better understand his personality. But the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He has intellect, he has emotion, he can be grieved. He's a he, not an it. And without the, that convincing and convicting power of the Holy Spirit, none of us could have ever come to Christ. Secondly, the moment you accepted Jesus as the Lord of your life, the Holy Spirit came into your life and began to indwell you. You see, every believer is indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit takes up residence in our lives when we put our faith in Jesus Christ. So the question may have come up as you were doing your lesson, did these 120 believers who met in the upper room in the book of Acts, did they already have the Holy Spirit? Yes, they did already have the Holy Spirit because back in the upper room when Jesus was still walking on the earth in John 20 and 22, it says, when he had said this, he showed them his hands, he showed them his side, then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. You see, you and I were temples of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will be with us and the Holy Spirit will be in us. And not only that, Ephesians 5, 18 and 19 says to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Because for each of us that are here that are believers, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. We can also ask to be filled by the Holy Spirit on a daily basis. That word Greek speaks of wind filling a sail. Can you picture it? You undock your boat and you're sitting on still water and calm air. And all of a sudden, that fresh wind comes to fill your sails, and off you go, you move with power. And in the same way, if you or I, we show up as a wife to our marriage, or in our role as a mom, or our role as a friend, or a sister, or a Bible study leader, or an usher, or a greeter, or really anything, any of our daily responsibilities or assignments that we have, without the Holy Spirit to move us, to guide us, and to direct us, you know what? We're probably, we've probably experienced this, and we don't have the Spirit working in us. We are impatient, we are bitter, we are ill-equipped, and we're lacking that enablement, enablement through his spirit to glorify him, and more importantly, to, to point others to Christ. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit comes upon us when he empowers us for his service. And this is what was about to happen at Pentecost, when we receive the power, that power to serve the Lord and to be witnesses to him. And we're going to talk a, a minute about what that baptism was going to enable the believers at Pentecost to do. But first, I wanted to talk for a second about what it's not. Some of you may, like me, may have stayed up late watching, stumbled across a Christian television show. And you may have seen some sort of version of the baptism of the Holy Spirit or being slain in the Holy Spirit. And... You may have seen that it may have caused that person to seem as if it caused that person to lose control of themselves. They may have been dropping on the ground and yelling and barking and, well, it just seems kind of weird, right? I remember something that my youth pastor, Pastor Steve Wilburn, used to say, and I think I have to say it like this, but he used to say, you know what? If it seems weird, it's probably because it is weird. And if you know Steve Wilburn, you can just picture it. Those words are so simple, but really the Holy Spirit gives us that check. You know, you walk into some place and you're like, okay, this seems weird. Well, it's probably because it is weird. You know, our God, the God that we serve, the God that we're empowered by is a God of peace and a God of order. 
And it says in John 14, 33, for God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. You know, the Holy Spirit is our helper. He's come to do a work in our lives. And I know that we're gonna be digging into that a little bit more next week, but let's talk for just a moment about what the Holy Spirit has come to do in my life, in your life, and in the life of every believer, really. So here are six things if you're taking notes. First, the first couple we already talked about. First off, the Holy Spirit is responsible for our conversion. It's the Holy Spirit who brings about the work of conversion in our lives. It's not you, it's not me, it's he. Secondly, the Holy Spirit indwells us. He lives inside of every believer. Thirdly, I love this, it's one of my favorites, the Holy Spirit seals us. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 says, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also having believed you were sealed with the holy spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory i love that i love the reality of the holy spirit sealing us his imprint is on our lives we are property of jesus christ a couple mornings ago, I was standing at my sink and I was doing dishes and straight out from my sink, you can see our driveway where my husband and I park our cars. And as I was standing there, I was kind of looking at my car and I realized that my driver's side door looked a little ajar, it looked a little open. And I was like, mm, let's just be the angle. I couldn't have left it open, you know, it's just, just the angle. So I went on with my morning and, you know, I'm sitting on the couch now with Paisley and Gabe walks up to the same spot that I'd been standing in the kitchen and he's like, Tiffany, I think you left your door open. Your, your door looks open. And I'm like, immediately, I'm like, okay, if he sees it too, I totally left my door open. Okay, I'm sorry, honey, I left it open, okay. So as we're packing up all the things to go out, you know, to leave for the day, we walk outside and Gabe notices that my back door is open too. So he's like, honey, you left your back door open too. And I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. You see, these types of things, they're, they're not too far-fetched for me right now. I, these aren't, you know, it's believable. So the doors were open and my wallet's sitting on the floor and our iPod's in the car. I'm like, oh my gosh, praise the Lord, you know, nothing got taken. And so then our neighbor comes over and she's like, hey guys, I just wanted to let you know that, you know, one of our cars got broken into last night and we're like, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry that your car got broken into. And we're like, man, I'm glad that they didn't break into our car. And then Gabe walks over to his truck and all his doors are open too. So we're like, okay, we got broken into too. So all of our cars had gotten broken into and the only thing that they took, they didn't take my wallet and take anything. All they took was um, Gabe had gone to the gym and he'd taken off his wedding ring as it tattooed on his hand. They'd taken his wedding ring. And so um, anyhow, I we were back in the house and Gabe was, had filed a police report and whatnot and I walk outside and he has this stack of ADT, you know, the alarm system, we have that alarm, a stack of ADT stickers. I'm not sure where in the world he got a stack as big as he did, but he had them and he was putting them all over our house, every window, every open space. I'm like, Honey, it looks like we're sponsored by ADT, really. Like, when the, that's the first thing you notice. I was telling my dad, and he was like, yeah, it looks like you guys are like wahoos, you know, but like with ADT stickers everywhere. And I was laughing, and I asked Gabe, like, what are you doing, honey? And he's like, well, if people see these stickers on our house, then they'll know that we have an alarm, and they won't bother breaking in. Now, I'm not sure if those ADT stickers are going to keep the thieves or the robbers out of our house, but... On a serious note, I do know that that seal that the Holy Spirit has on the life of a believer is going to cause that ultimate thief, the devil, the one who came to do nothing but to kill, steal, and destroy, he's going to stop before he approach, approaches us. And he's going to say, oh, this one, this one, this one belongs, this one belongs to God. This one has the seal of the Holy Spirit on it. And it's going to cause him to stop. And you know what, as Kathy said last week, we need not fear. We need not fear because Satan doesn't have that free reign in our lives to do whatever he wants because we belong to Christ. We have that seal of the Holy Spirit. Fourthly, the Holy Spirit brings about spiritual fruit in our lives. 
Matthew 7, 20 says, it's by their fruits that you will know them. And what is fruit? Fruit is love. Galatians 5, 22 says that it's love. And with that love comes, and I love how the message translation gives us a little bit of uh, explanation on these. With that love comes joy, the exuberance of life, peace, serenity, patience, the ability to stick with things even through trials, kindness, that sense of compassion in our hearts, goodness, faithfulness, of that sense of being loyally committed, gentleness, not feeling the way to the need to force our way through life, and self-control, really being able to direct our energies with wisdom. Because the Holy Spirit dwells within the believers, we can be kind to the unkind. We can have a healthy, loving marriage. We can experience that joy and, and patience as we're raising our little ones. It says that they will know us by our fruit. What does your fruit inventory look like right now? Fifthly, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray. And I love this passage, Romans 8, 26 and 27. It says, likewise, the Holy Spirit also helps in our weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And this scripture is so important to me because I remember the first time someone shared it with me, and I remember learning it for the first time. As I mentioned um, early on in my walk with the Lord, I was attending these prayer meetings and home Bible studies, and it was so cool because these homes would be just packed with young people, just worshiping, you know, playing the guitar and singing, and we would just all be praying. And I remember one in particular, we were at a friend's house and the room was packed. And I remember it was cold. I remember I was wearing a sweatshirt. It was like in the fall or the winter. And I was in their home and I was sitting on the arm of a couch because the room was so full. And I remember it was towards the end of the prayer meeting and everyone had kind of prayed. And, and I hadn't prayed. And I felt my heart just beginning to pound within my chest. I thought it was just going to jump out. And I began to get overheated. My face started to get red. And I was, I mean, I remember it was cold. So I knew it was just like, hey, what's going on here? And I remember knowing and feeling that the Holy Spirit was putting it on my heart that I needed to pray. And some of you might be able to identify with that, even in your group time or when you run into someone and they're telling them of, they're telling you of something that might be going on in their life and you know that the Holy Spirit wants you to pray, but you're like, what do I pray? And at that time I was thinking, everything's been covered. What would I say? What would they think? But I knew that the Holy Spirit was calling me to do it and all I had to do was just to open my mouth. And the same is for you. I don't remember what I prayed. I just remember that it was short and I remember that it was not of me. Or maybe the situation is that you're praying for someone who has just gone through something tragic or some big trial in their life. Or maybe it's you're in your own prayer closet and you're praying about something that's gone on in your life and you just don't know how to pray. You don't know what to pray. It's okay because we know that the Lord makes, he makes intercession for us according to his will. I love that. The Holy Spirit makes intercession for us according to the will of God. That's so important. And what a comfort that is to us. We can rest in that. If we're praying and all we can get out, get out is a word or even a groan or just a cry out to the Lord, he knows. And the Spirit is being strong. He's helping us in our weakness. And sixthly, he brings scripture to our remembrance. I love this quote by Chuck Swindoll. He wrote, I know of no other single practice in the Christian life more rewarding, practically speaking, than memorizing scripture. No other single exercise pays greater dividends, spiritual dividends. Your prayer life will be strengthened. Your witnessing will be sharp, sharper and much more effective. Your attitudes and outlook will begin to change. Your mind will become alert and observant. Your confidence and assurance will be enhanced and your faith will be solidified. I love that. Memorizing scripture is going to make our gaze on Jesus steadier and clearer. Memorizing scripture is going to help us daily to triumph over sin. 
Psalm 119, verse 9, and then verse 11, it says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. And then verse 11 says, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Verse, uh, memorizing scripture will help us to comfort and counsel others. We all know that we don't always have our Bible on handy, because, but that's okay because I've heard that when the word of God is spoken spontaneously from your heart, it has unusual power. And isn't it so true? Think about when someone's pouring into you and they're encouraging you or they're counseling and the word of God is just flowing off of their tongues. You're like, those words are from the word of God. Those words are truth. Proverbs 25, 11 says, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in a setting of silver. Memorizing scripture will help us to communicate the gospel to non-believers. There is no power like the word of God when we're sharing the gospel. For example, the Romans Road. I remember when I first started street witnessing and sharing my faith, I memorized the Romans Road as probably some of you had as well. And it's so effective. It's the most important tool when we're sharing the gospel to use scripture, to memorize that scripture that's in our heart. And fifthly, memorizing scripture will enhance our fellowship with the Lord. When we meditate on who God is, when we meditate on what he's done and the promises that, we made, that he's made for us and the hope that we have in him, and we know him better because of what his word has to say about, it, about him, then our time with him is so significantly richer and sweeter because we know who we're fellowshipping with. We know who we're worshiping. We know who we're making our petitions to. Moving on to verse six, it says, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons which the father has put in his own authority. It's been said that there are as many errors in this question as there are words. It was clear that the disciples were still very unclear about this kingdom of which Jesus so frequently spoke of. Verse 6 that we just read, it said that they asked Jesus if he was going to restore the kingdom. And that word restore right there, that verb means in context that they were looking for some sort of political or territorial restoration. They were looking for that immediate, tangible change for the nation of Israel. But the kingdom that Christ was speaking of was not one that they could find on a map. It wasn't one of political dominion or freedom from that rule and reign that Rome had taken over. But with that being said, I think it's important to note that this kingdom that Christ spoke of would have implications that would affect the nation politically and socially. The spiritual and spirit-filled kingdom that Jesus often spoke of would collide with that secular world even as it does today. For example, John Stott says, the citizens of God's kingdom would steadfastly deny Caesar the supreme loyalty for which he hungered, but which they insisted on giving to Jesus Christ alone. That's speaking for the day of the believers in the book of Acts. But even today, as we seek first his kingdom by taking a stand for the biblical principles, such as marriage, the way that God designed it to be between a man and a woman, by not giving in to those pressures or provisions that our society has made for abortion, as we are constantly striving to protect our religious freedoms in a world, in a society that's constantly just trying to push Christ out, we too will collide with that physical, political kingdom of our day. But at this point, when Jesus was talking, he wasn't talking about a physical kingdom. But what he said to them was, it's not time for you to know. And I think we can receive from that because you know what? We don't always know. And it's not always time for us to know what God is doing in our lives even. Sometimes we just need to Stay the course that we've been given, that we've been commissioned in the here and the now. Verse 8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. 
So we know that the believers, as they were waiting in that upper room, we know that they had the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them. But this power that's talked about right here in verse 8, this is talking about the Spirit coming upon them. He was about to give them a power stronger than anything that the world had known up to that point. This is the power that would take those 120 believers. We have well over 120 believers in this room right now. 120 believers in that upper room and their converts. And then later on, we'll read in Acts 17, 6, that they would turn their world upside down. You know, they liked us. Kathy mentioned last week that they lived in a godless world. They lived in the Roman Empire. And like ours, even their religious formations were corrupt. They lived in a world of idolatry and spiritism and demon worship and immorality. The Christians were persecuted and opposed at every angle. But this promise of the Holy Spirit coming upon them was going to change everything. There were 10 days from the time that Jesus made that promise to the time that the Spirit would come upon them. Their world was about to be rocked. Things were about to change dramatically. And so many times we sit with our friends or on our blogs or in our social media posts that we make and we talk about how incredibly dark and how depraved our world is and how we just, we need that revival. And yes, we do need that revival. And yes, our world is dark and our world is depraved. But we know we come to a church and we learn week in and week out that revival starts where? In the heart in the heart of the believer, in the heart of the church, right? In our hearts. If we really embraced that power that God extends to us, even just in this room alone, can you imagine what God could do through us? The options are limitless. Pastor Greg says that we need to rekindle the fire of the Holy Spirit in our hearts and let it blaze out through our lives to touch the world around us. And Vance Havner once said, we are not going to move this world by criticism of it, nor conformity to it, but by the combustion within it of lives ignited by the Spirit of God. And this is what the 120 believers were praying for. This is what they were waiting for. They were waiting to be ignited so that they could move their world. Isn't that inspiring? Verse 9 says, now when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, I love that, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. After he had spoken these things, he was taken up. And those words, he was taken up, are mentioned four times in this chapter. And I think it's important that we remember that. This same Jesus was taken up. He was the same Jesus that had been crucified, the same Jesus that had risen from the dead, and now he was being glorified, and he sits at the right hand of the Father, this Jesus man, now in all of his glory. And we know, we just read that the apostles were looking steadfastly up towards heaven. And what a message that is for us, to always be looking steadfastly towards heaven. There is a day coming near when we are going to ascend with Christ. And until then, our job is to wait, but to actively be waiting for the coming of Christ. Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. In John 7, he said, For I am with you only for a short time, and then I'm going to the one who sent me. In John 16, 28, he says, I came from the Father and entered this world. Now I'm leaving this world, and I'm going back to the Father. He had been telling them that this was going to happen. He had, begin, he had began to prepare them that this would happen. And as he went up, the apostles were standing there and they were looking up. And I can almost guarantee that that commission that he had given them was ringing so loud in their hearts and in their minds. Those last words that he gave to them. 
He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be the witnesses in me, witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus had laid it out so clearly for them. It's almost as if he had laid, laid out a divine outline for evangelism. He said to start with Jerusalem. He said to start with the guiltiest city, the city that cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. He said to start there. That would have been hard. Where is that for you? Is it in your home? with people that know you best, maybe people that have hurt you, or maybe it's with your friends, that close circle of friends that you have. Maybe it's that neighbor that you pass, cross paths with as you pull into the driveway and they're pulling in. It's not a matter of if he's calling us because we know that he is calling us. He's calling us to tell them about God's grace and about his truth and about his love that we've experienced as believers. You have the power, use it. Tap into that resource of the Holy Spirit and go. And then Jesus said to go to Judea and Samaria, wherever that is for you. But first, home base, go and tell them, go and tell your home base that Jesus Christ is Lord. Go and tell them that Jesus Christ died on the cross and he rose again and that he wants to forgive them of their sins and he wants to carry them, carry their burdens for them and give them life and life abundantly. This was the commission for the apostles, but this is also our commission. And it completely and utterly inspires me to think of what we might do if we allowed the power of the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us as they did in the book of Acts. Next week, you'll read Acts 2.39, and it says, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are afar off, for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. So that just shows us that it's not a matter of if we are called, because we are called. And I ask you to ask yourself this this morning. Do you want to do dynamic things through the power of the Holy Spirit? I would venture to guess that every woman that is a believer in this room wants to do dynamic things through the power of the Holy Spirit. If we want that, all we have to do is to ask. Pastor Greg said, people of power are people of spirit. If you want God's power flooding in your life, you need God's spirit flooding in your life. And it's true because power is spirit. There may be some of you today that, like me, as you went over your lesson this week, as you read, read the first chapter of Acts, you may have felt encouraged, you may have felt inspired, you may have felt excited and challenged to go out in the power of the Holy Spirit and minister to your family, your friends, and your neighbors, and even those strangers that you come across. And I think like you, some of me, like me, some of you may have that same excitement and feel that same nudge to do that, but some of us just need to be asked to ask the Lord to fill us with his Holy Spirit, that fresh filling. Did you know that you could leave today knowing that the Holy Spirit power is alive and he's inside of you and he's equipping you and giving you power and boldness to serve him and to bear witness to him? And you know, I think that we as a body, that for those of us that are believers here, want to be filled with the Spirit, that we should do that even now. So if you would, just bow your heads and close your eyes right now. If you're here this morning and you are excited and you are encouraged by the Word of God and you feel challenged to go out in the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can minister to those around you, would you just raise your hand? Just raise your hand if you want to be filled with the Spirit. We're just going to ask him together as a group and you individually in your heart. You just raise your hand. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you so much for the power 
that is available to us, that power to come inside of us and equip us to do the work that God has in store for each one of us. And as we're standing here with our hands raised, Lord, we ask, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would give us a fresh filling of your spirit, that we would bear the fruits of your spirit, that we would have that power to bear witness of you. So as our hands are raised, we just ask that you would fill us even now. And we thank you, Lord, for making that available to us. We thank you for your word that tells us the ability that that power has even through the early church, and we wanna see it here. We're hungry for it, we wanna move. And I pray that you would move amongst the, these women just as you did in that day, Lord. That's very same power, that very same Jesus. And as we wait for you to come back, we look steadfastly towards heaven, waiting, actively waiting for your coming. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name, amen.